Welcome to the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author, Vaughn Germer and corporate innovator, Michelle Brigman. Come here weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Hi, I'm Fawn Germer. And I'm Michelle Brigman. And this is the Hard One Wisdom Podcast. We got all excited today because we had Susan Shapiro Barish on our program to talk about toxic friendships in a previous season. And since this season is all about ways that we settle in life, we started talking about having friendships that were kind of meh in our lives. And we're like, oh, that's a perfect excuse to get Susan back. She's like a long lost sister and she's fabulous. This woman writes fiction under the name of Susanna Marin and nonfiction under Susan Shapiro Barish. She has been a teacher at, at for a long time at Marymount Manhattan College, guest taught at Sarah Lawrence College, and just she's a writer's writer, but she also understands friendships. And so we're so glad to have you back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much, both of you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. And you know, what got me talking about this is this this happened early in life in my 20s i had somebody that i used to hang out with every day we would go to dinner or to lunch or to do something we were all young reporters at this paper and she and i just always did things we lived in the same apartment complex and then she got another job and moved away and when she left i realized i did not miss her at all not in the slightest. Now, you would have thought there would have been some pang of longing for this friendship that had consumed so much time. And it was then that I realized that sometimes we have friendships that are kind of just placeholders so that we have company, but they aren't that meaningful. So I want to talk to you about things like that and what makes a a friendship meaningful, long-lasting, and worth the effort that it takes. So thoughts on that? Female friendships, this is a female friend, right, Fern, that you're speaking of. They're so complicated. And the societal message is that we must have our female friends. Of course, the other societal message is, can you believe she did that to me? So the mixed message that comes through is loud and clear. I mean, you know, if you remember Golden Girls, there was like this fad about it. And, you know, young women on college campuses were all congregating to watch these older women in their, you know, in terms of their friendship. But we also know what female rivalry is. We also know what a friend who depletes us feels like. And most of all, we are told that we must have these friends. And so when one moves away, as in your story, might be the only time that you really get to assess honestly what was going on yes so true and what you know what is it that makes us want friends so much not just because we're supposed to have them but what is the need that they're supposed to fill and how do you know whether that's being satisfied i think there's the deep intrinsic um hope that we will connect with people that we will be known by others. Um, In my book, Toxic Friends, I looked at, excuse me, several types of women friendships, you know, female friendships. And one of them is the the mirroring friend. And women really hope for that so that you're kind of in the same boat, whatever boat that is, whatever stage of life. So as you describe your story, it was that you were both young reporters. And so that in common, And when that shifted, you had to really examine if the friendship went beyond the shared identity or, you know, shared common, a a common interest and bond. And that happens a lot. You know, I've interviewed women at all these different stages of their lives, all different ages. And what they'll tell me is, well, you know, we both were getting divorced. We both were getting remarried. We both were widowed. We both had our first children. 
or, you know, mommy and me groups are reflecting what, you know, everyone's experiencing at the same time. So there's that theory of like with like, you know, that's so much a part of our culture that in you, I see me and therefore I am understood. And in a patriarchal culture, women really want strong female friendships to carry them through. You ever notice how with your female friends, you will have an intimacy that guys never really seem to achieve with their friendships? I think you're making a good point. The, the, male, tr the male journey can't be compared to the female journey. So, and again, as I always say, we live in a patriarchal culture. So there's a lot more male supremacy. Now, we don't talk about female supremacy because it doesn't really exist. So when you have a situation where men can kind of do whatever they want and get away with it, they're not as developed. I mean, women are acrobatic partly because it's a survival mechanism. Women are multifaceted because how else can you get through in a culture where there's more male privilege? So women are looking for a lot more in their friendships and expect a lot from each other, partly because that's how they navigate a path. How's this hitting you, Michelle? Yeah. So you said something earlier. You were talking about like the the making friends, like it's fine with your story of your the commonality, the mirroring that brings you together. And I was sitting here just reflecting on that, thinking about I spent we've spent so much time teaching our children how to make friends. How are you making friends? How, but what we aren't doing is how do you when is it time to release that? relationship right because right now it's like if you lose a friend it's bad we've done something wrong there's a drama well, yeah. where is this lesson or I, I, I i'm trying to kind of form this in a question but it's more around this aha moment you gave me of we teach this but we don't teach that it's okay and then the steps of how do you pull out of it whenever it's just no longer working anymore. Not bad, but maybe unnecessary. That's very troubling. It's very troubling because, first of all, as females, we're constantly judged. So if you fail at a female friendship, then you've really failed. And, you know, you feel that others are saying, well, how could she have done that or what really happened? And Another reason that we cling to friends and don't let go is because oftentimes she's part of this friend in particular, whom you'd like to not be so close with, is part of a group. And putting but, that whole group in jeopardy is really troubling for women. And they so much want the support of the group that the idea that that could be threatened is probably overwhelming a decision to extricate yourself from the friendship. Or when you get dumped. I mean, that, well, that, that sucks well, so bad. And I, you know, I have to, it's, that's like the one thing women rarely discuss is the friends that dump them. And yet I have had many women tell me that it's happened to them. And I'm assuming it happens to just about everybody. It happens so often and it's so painful. And it, as I understand it based on the diverse group of women with whom I've spoken for the study, an ongoing study, um, it, it creates a lot of self-doubt where you say, well, what happened? What could I have done? And a lot of, and a great deal of loss. Now, you didn't feel lost when that friend moved away, but it also sounds like you didn't have any big specific incident with her. It just no. ended. Okay. But when there is a, some sort of inciting incident, between female friends, the repercussions are pretty profound. And women feel very, very unhappy as the one who's left behind or the one who actually precipitates the breakup. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've certainly experienced that as well. <laughs> That's I don't, haven't we? Haven't we all? But it's funny because it's like this trick, like you, do, it's, sometimes it's not just a sudden, complete break. You think about social media now. Now it's like you're still friends in social media. So 
do they like your stuff? Do you, do you like their stuff? Do you say anything? It's like this passive aggressive behavior because you're sort of frozen and don't know what to do because heaven forbid you unfriend them. Then that's oh. like a slap in the face. And that's not what you want. Like it's common. I think the most mentally healthy thing you can do in a situation like that is to unfriend and block, but you can't do that because then you can't snoop and see what's going on with them. Even when there's no big incident or drama, like, does it that? But the fact that we're so invested in these yeah. friendships and that we hold the bar so high and we act as if a female friend will solve all our problems and fill a void and She's only another woman trying to get through in a complicated world. And we have to remember that. And then what makes it divisive? You know, your friend announces she's moving to California from Florida and you feel betrayed. How dare she? But she needs to go for many reasons. Maybe it's her work, her family, a family member, her husband's work, whatever. But the idea that that we are so hoping to have this friend in a certain place in our life in a certain way makes it really complex for everyone. And, and I think sometimes when a friendship goes south and the only explanation you sometimes get is just because, that eats at us because, you know, we're, we're raised to be good nurturing people and close the loop and be kind. And then somehow somebody we've been kind to and loved doesn't love us just because. Well, and how about do we know these, these women? I mean, in our society, divorce and breakups with boyfriends and partners and, you know, failed love relationships are, you know, it's not that we have we applaud them or think they have to happen, but they are accepted when they do happen. Yeah. That isn't with female friendships, it just has a lot more to it that makes everyone pause. You know, um, for instance, a good example of female friendships that have really succeeded for years is um what we see in Sex in this, what we saw in Sex in the City, and now we see in their um, newly invented um, series called And Just Like That, where these women support each other. They're, you know, they're all going through whatever they are. I mean, Charlotte has teenage daughters who are troubling, and I think her husband must be a yawn. I think that's one of the messages. And Sarah Jessica Parker, as we know, is a widow looking for. Her, part, her character for new love. And, and then we have Miranda who questions her sexuality. But what's always a given in this story is that when they come together, they give each other such significant support. But, but where's the asterisk on this is where was Samantha? That like so nobody Samantha, could make peace with the fact that Samantha wasn't there. No, and Samantha's missing. And we know that. And we know that there was just a quick you know, cameo appearance in this last, yeah, in the last um, season. But what we also know is that they're emblematic of friends as family. So except in, for uh. all the years of Sex in the City, except for the fact that Charlotte's, I'm sorry, that Miranda's character married to Steve had a mother-in-law a long time ago, played by Ann Mira. Yeah. We never saw family members. That wasn't part of it. And I believe that was the very intentional message of friends as family, which is really a tricky business because we're holding the bar very high. My mind is absolutely blown or I'd like it is going right now. I'm having this realization of we are more accepting of our friends divorcing oh, and yes. breaking up than yeah. we are of a friendship ending. Like what the heck? I'd like right. to totally... I'm just hit between the eyes in terms of it's all starting to make sense. Oh, he, it's like oh somebody's going to think there's something the matter with me. Yes. Why doesn't she like me? And, you know, I'm cool. Yeah. You, the... know what's, you know, you just as in a love relationship, you either grow together or you grow apart. That's just the way it goes. And 
in this, in my study, Toxic Friends, when the women were no longer on the same path and, and their lives had really diverged, was when the test of friendship became very known to them because there's lots of rivalry and jealousy, competition. So two women, they're single, they work together, they have great careers. One gets married, moves to the suburbs, to the city, has a baby, has another baby. No longer so relatable. You'll see. In a divorce, who stands behind you? Who thinks you're going to be contagious? Um, how about making friends as a single woman? That usually, again, that like with like theory, you know, the theory of homogamy, um, that we're attracted to those who are similar to us. So you go, and, and in this case, I'm not talking about in terms of religion or race or ethnicity or level of education, all that, you know, that we look at, like I look at whenever I interview women for my nonfiction book. No, we're just talking about how women join these groups that where they're all the same. And in and what's interesting about that is it's like the same cause. Like we're all breastfeeding our babies. We're all um having weddings in the next year. You know, we're we're all moving to a retirement community. Whatever, you know, and everything in between. We all just graduated law school and we're getting our jobs and Whatever it is, it, and that goes, and that really is about experience and what we hope for. So what's interesting about that with female friendships is it's not about being the same religion or, you know, often the same age, but not, but not what part of the country you come from. It's not, it's, it's all about experiences that bond you, you know, new mothers, everyone has a kid who just started kindergarten. Um, if we look at the um, Reese Witherspoon series. What was it called? Um, Big Little Lies. Yeah. The women were distinctive, but their experience as kindergarten mothers is what bound them. So there's a lot of that that happens. And then within those circles or within a one on one friendship, it doesn't always work because there might not be enough respect or trust or a, confi a, a confidence is shared and maybe it's really shocking to the other person or you treat your child so differently than your new friend would treat her child. Maybe there's a COVID breakout and you know, you're not, you're not sending your kid to school and everyone else is. So, you know, all these, again, I can't help but say it more and more, the judgment, what binds us together, what keeps us together, can break us apart. Boy, this is, this is really powerful. I think when you're talking about confidence, the other thing is sometimes I think you get a little too close and you know a little too much, and that's very uncomfortable for the other person when they start to realize they, they don't too much. It, it makes it very hard to move away. And the, the sense of loss, I mean, I go back to your story at the beginning, so many women really do sense a loss. And at the same time, we replace friends. Women really replace friends and we categorize friends. Um, women in, I've interviewed women at all, of all different ages. And as I said, a very diverse group. And um, in a retirement community, who plays bridge? Who plays tennis? You know, who, who wants to be in a re reading groups, book clubs? Oh, big deal. Tennis, sports, bowling. Um, and then how the women treat each other. And it's really, really something. It's almost as if no one's figured out that fifth grade wasn't that kind or reasonable. That's the most amazing thing, too, because I'm in my 60s now and seeing that People, it's it's like junior high school has recreated itself in everything from a group of retired wiki watchy mermaids into every possible group of women that you see. That there is, there's, it's Mean Girls. It's it, it that mean never girls. stops, and, and it's typecasting and it's categorizing. It's very harsh, but at the same time, everyone wants friends. Or you start shape shifting, right? Because it's like, well, I want to 
participate in that group that we have this commonality, but then I also have this other group over here and how you can show up very differently in those groups as well. Maybe that's my problem. I always show up the same. <laughs> um, you know, I wonder, here's one thing I got that I wonder, because I, I have a, I have a lot of friends because I've, I've had two careers that put a lot of people in front of me and I'm good at staying in touch with everybody. People are starting to get sick. That is depressing to hear about. Mm -hmm. And also, I, it's hard to show up. If you've got so many people with so many different things, it's hard to show up and be a great friend to so many people. What do you do when you've got a problem like that? Where you're saying the important people to you are suffering in one way or another? Yeah, but there are a lot of them. Like, you know, I can spend my life I, I have a lot of friends who are sick. Are you going pulling through. from some of them? Is that what the struggle? Well, I'm kind of trying to figure it. Right? I need to figure out how to do that. A better job, I think, right now of just having my closest friends and then letting some of these others maybe drift aside. Because even hearing people, and I don't know why they do it, but we know people like to tell you about their doctor appointments and their problems, and and just I don't want to hear that all the time. Well, Susan, you called it depleting friends, right? The depleting relationships. And that's a bit of what I hear you really, describe. Yeah, where you're just drained from it. And at the same time, you know, we need to be there for our friends. It's, it, these friendships in contemporary society are very, very complicated because you don't want to turn your back on someone because she's suffering or struggling. And at the same time, you can't lose yourself to what goes on. And I think that women have so many obligations as, you know, as women on this earth that, you know, if life were a pie for women, you know, there's the piece that is career. There's the piece that is lo our love relationships, children, if you have them, grandchildren as the years go on, and then the friends. And, you know, sometimes women can't even make enough pie for their friends, they say. Yeah, so it, well, it's, it's a lot. I, I just. The most important thing is the friend who's really flexible and supportive. Because then you won't find yourself really apologizing or feeling like you let her down. I mean, yeah, no I one feel guilty or regretful. And no, then it's, what it's, not, it? it's not guilt. It's, I would love to be a great friend for them, but there's too many. I mean, honestly, we're, it, there's a lot no, but of you know, But you know those friends, What you know those friends that you've been busy, or let's say this, Vaughn, you just went on your summer tour of the States, right? That friend that didn't get invited or didn't show up to the gathering, and then you've got like this guilt because, oh, you didn't make a point of stopping and seeing them. It's that kind of, that's the other thing that's that struggle where people then, that's that guilt that comes from, oh, now you're judging me for not being a good enough friend because. Well, there, there's a lot of hierarchy. I think you're raising the issue of hierarchy. You know, who is most important? And who gets, and then exclusion versus inclusion. Mm -hmm. And why there seems to be that, that thread, which I've never really understood. I mean, it can't hurt to include everyone, but there's a lot of exclusion, especially, um, I would like to say it's clannish and it, but I cannot say it affects only women of a certain age. The clannishness starts so early that, like, if my granddaughter were here, she's turning 11, she would tell you about it. Well, her. And, you know, how, she, you know, she wants no part of it, I hope. And, and who her close friends are. And then we go through it, you know, that's, it's great. How long will we go through it? Our whole lives. What, what about the friends that blam your secrets? Well, that's really a betrayal, a, a breach of trust, isn't it? Um, I interviewed women who have experienced that or have even done it, because I always listen to both sides. That's a big one. That's really heavy. And of course, it depends on how profound the secret is. 
but you have to be really careful. You have to be really careful. And boy, I've, I've had enough friends who tell me, because this never has happened to me, thankfully, that, you know, their husband or loved one ended up having an affair with their best friend. And I think, how does that even happen? It happens. Is it a, but was that a true best friend who had a no, weak moment no, or was no, that, that somebody who was bad the whole time? Well, this is what I was saying earlier, that we, how well do we know our friend? How, <laughs> how, you know, who is this person really? And what, and that goes to another kind of hierarchy. What's more important, the friendship or that man who happens to be her husband? So there's a lot going on there. But the idea that you can have these healthy friendships, the friend who really can be counted on, the friend who will not let you down, the friend who will help you at a time of need, you know, that's very valuable. And, you know, we know we, in this culture, a coupled society, it's not just romantic love. It's not just straight heterosexual couples. It's all kinds of connections. And women are really searching for best friends and a group of friends. That's what they're looking for wherever they go. What about the, the idea that you have a best friend who is trustworthy, but you think that they're going to be there for life? And you've made it through 10 years and then 20 years and then something happens and then gone. Is, is a lifelong best friend the rule or the exception? There are no guarantees to anywhere. When you're raised as a good girl, you expect that if you do the right thing and you put your best foot forward and you are respectful and diligent, that all good will come. But we all know life isn't like that. It's just a very hard, bitter lesson to understand. You think you're marrying the right guys. You think your children will follow your lead. You think that your best friend will be the one who is always at your side. You believe in these precepts that don't often play out. And that's why in my fiction, I have surprise endings in all my novels because it's very important to me to show what the journey really is for women. And that is, despite our best intentions, we do not control the end. The wow. end. We do not. And that encompasses friendships, partnering, relations, you know, love relationships, marriages, careers, children, no children. It doesn't, it, you know, thinking you'll have children, maybe you won't. You know, all of it is what we dream of and what we're told we must have versus what really happens. You know, Susan, when we were talking about having you again, it, it was that, you know, we're looking at the notion that sometimes we settle in life. And so, you know, we've, we've talked about really bad friendships. And then, of course, the one that I had that was just a mediocre one that I didn't realize it was mediocre. But it, sh should we constantly be evaluating our friendships to see if they are serving us? And if they're not, what do you do about something like that? Well, constantly evaluating or measuring is only necessary if it's kind of not optimal. And I think if the friendship is truly, I'm going to use this word, organic, and authentic, then you and the friend reap the rewards of it. And the trust is just within the friendship. If you're not searching for it. You're not hoping against hope that you'll get it. It's just there. And once it's just there, then we, we flourish with those relationships. We don't have to keep assessing them and dissecting them and evaluating because they're satisfying enough. And but sometimes in any sometimes, relation. Sometimes it feels like it's there and it's not, though. Well, that is usually revealed to us by what happens. And I go back to your story. She moves away. You realize it wasn't that great. Um, a friend betrays you. 
you know that you were wrong about her. But that's an inciting incident. You know, you said your friend or someone you know was having an affair with her. Yeah. With her best friend's husband. Okay. That's a pretty like egregious situation. So on so many levels, you lose your best friend, you lose the, you know, trust in your husband. What do you do with it? Well, that really depends on who you are. Doubtful that you'll go back to the friend, but I've interviewed women who have. Maybe the husband was a cab and they both laugh in the end, at the end of it. But the point is, is that something gets broken and has to be reevaluated in a very serious way. I think you're just doing such a great job of kind of reminding, I know me, of just give give the friendships grace, right? Because it's whenever the expectations are so unrealistic that they're the everything and going to solve everything and I've got to be perfect. And we just sort of relax all of those things because as I'm listening to this, and I think about what are the, truly the most cherished friendships I have that have stood the test of time is that there, there's not a ton of expectation. I, there's underlying values, though. I know I can trust them. I know when I pick up the phone and call, they are going to be right there and they're going to be loving and accepting. I may not be talking to them every day. I may not talk to them, but twice Thanks. a year, but it is predictable and consistent and dependable. And I value that above all else. And it's okay. So just, again, just it, having these really high unrealistic expectations, whenever to your point that women were complicated, it's complex, life is hard. And sometimes we just, we, we set those relationships up for failure when we um, hold them in that, to that standard that's not achievable? Well, I think I started out by saying that this is funny. I mean, there are two, there are mixed messages. So when I, all those years teaching at Marymount and living in New York City, I would literally take the bus down Lexington Avenue to get to the school. And I've taken the bus up there to get home at the end of the day. And one day years ago, when I started this ongoing study on toxic friends, I heard these young women talking about, you know, that a friend had, you know, could you believe she did that to me? That was me eavesdropping on the way down. On the way back uptown, I heard two women, more mature, saying, what would I do without my female friend? Yeah. And there's the rub. So we're expecting something always and at the same time being very concerned about what how it plays out or what might happen. I don't know if you remember the film Heathers, but in it, when remember that very dark comedy where a young Winona Ryder gives her best friend poison, and then Kristen Slater, I think. Now, don't quote me on all of this. It's a distant memory. Says you just you just poisoned your best friend and her character says and worst enemy so this is you know the dark side of talking about female friendships and there's something else i wanted to say and that is sometimes we really don't know who is there for us and at what level until a time of great need yeah or, oh that's the truth or great yeah. joy so you know I interviewed a woman recently who so expected her friend to be there for her, and she wasn't. Yeah. Um, and she let the friendship go because the friend didn't show up at a critical time. And then I've also interviewed women who say, I can't believe this friend. I mean, we weren't that close, and here she is coming through for me in every way during a very, very challenging ordeal in the family. So I think we also learn as we go. And that's hard for us because we expect what we expect. That's I, You know, that's the one thing I would say. Friendship is not a quid pro quo experience. You do not get what you give to the people you give it to every time, but you will get what you give somewhere. So it's exactly like what you said. That friend may not show up, but that one does. And that that's always a wonderful thing to learn 
who your true ones are. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've, I've watched that as a number of friends have gotten sick and they're like, well, you know, I remember one, this friend said that this woman had stayed after a breakup for months at her house so she could land on her feet. And then when she told her that, you know, she'd moved on and then she told her that she had cancer, the friend never even called to check on her. And, and, but it's just, it's not a quid pro quo. You know, I'm curious when you did the study, what exactly did you ask and what were you looking for? So I did a questionnaire. I can share a few of the questions with you. Um, I asked, um, of course, the age and, you know, if women have a best friend and how long that's been. And did you ever feel manipulated by a friend or betrayed and how? And have you ever had a toxic friend? Because the book is called Toxic Friends. And did you stay after the breakup? And if you broke up, what was the main reason? And I gave them some choices. So what I listed based on my study um, includes a lack of loyalty, religious reasons, different values, men, children, emotional neediness, money. So this is what I'm looking at. And then um, how would you describe yourself as a friend? And, um, you know, what factors play into a falling out? You know, jealousy, mothering, mental illness, addiction, different values, again, money, men. Um, have you ever been reunited? So 58% of the women in my studies that they have been reunited with a friend. And I found based on speaking with several hundred women for this study, that um, that was considered a real high in terms of life. You know, how significant was the idea of being reunited with a friend? And it was pretty significant. And here's a good question. Did they stay reunited? Um, some did and some didn't. But 58% of the women did reunite. And then a few reported to me that they found it was the same issue surfacing after a while. Um, what about choosing a friend because you believed it would improve your personal situation in terms of career or children or social status? And what about being twins, what I call the twinning syndrome, where you know you see yourself and this friend and you're both going through the exact same experience. So, of course, you feel so connected. And then have you ever felt tricked by a friend? Would you, do you believe you'd forgive a friend more readily than a husband or a child or a boyfriend? And are you competitive or jealous by nature? So these are the sorts of questions. I could go on and on. But the yeah, point so with the, we got a time thing going. Michelle had one other thing she was hoping we could do before we were out because that, that sounds like yeah. you got a lot from it. And all of that research and study, I mean, just as kind of a friendships are so important to us. So, what wisdom and advice would you give our li listeners to really make the most of our friendships and get the most joy and fulfillment from it? To really understand who you are in the friendship and what you really have with this person. And not to do what we do so much with romantic relationships, which is to say, oh, he's a really a great guy, is he? Were you listening? Or were you just like admiring him at the dinner table, you know, on the first or second date? I mean, are you really, really aware of your friend's values, of what she would do in a crisis? And there's been a lot of recognition of disparate values since, you know, since the election in 2000. Yeah, I was waiting for that to come up. Yes. Yeah, and, and since COVID. And a lot of interviewees told me in my ongoing study that they've really let go of friends. You know, COVID made them reassess their lives, what matters. And so you either grab on to that friend you lost or you weren't maybe attentive enough to, and you fix it. Or you say, you know what? T life is short and you let it, the friend go. Good advice. That's good advice. I think that's a good reminder of like, just who am I? Do the self-reflection. Okay. And then am, what am I really getting from exactly. this? And that would make, a, I think a lot of us maybe really make some changes. Invest more in some and time to 
uh, be grateful and let the other ones go. I'm just, I'm just so glad that actually you just gave me a lot of other perspectives to think about in terms of friendships and again, our expectations of them. So I'm so glad to have you again. Yeah. And we want to, we want to know people need to read these books. So tell, tell us about the latest book you would recommend about friendship. I think Toxic Friends is sort of ever. And I also wrote a book um, called Tripping the Prom Queen, The Truth About Women and Rivalry. And that takes a look at how women are really pitted against each other in our society often and why we all operate with a limited goods theory. You know, there's not enough pie. So if your friend achieves that, instead of being happy for her, maybe you're envious or jealous. Because you feel she got it, you won't. We have to stop thinking that way. So let's be inclusive, not exclusive. Let's be gracious and generous and not judgmental and small. This all really matters. It really counts for healthy bonds. Awesome. Susan, thank you so much, everybody. That's Susan Shapiro Barish. And we are glad to have you back. And we'll see you when that next book comes out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Always so great to be with you both. Thank you for joining the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author Fawn Germer and corporate innovator Michelle Brigman. Join us weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Visit hardwonwisdom.com for more on this podcast and for links to Fawn and Michelle's web pages and social media. Also, be sure to rate, subscribe, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort, and we'll see you next week.